I think that's it from me for now. So all I'm going to do is uh, welcome somebody who's a dear friend, uh, Octavius, come join us. Uh, Octavius doesn't probably need much of an introduction, but having set up Mind Gym in uh, 2021, uh, one of the leaders in its space, um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you here to, to tell us about what you've been up to this year. Jolly, fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Fantastic to see you all. Good morning. Excellent. As you gather, my name is Octavius, not the name I chose, but one I'm getting used to. Um, and I founded Mind Gym in my kitchen uh, 20, uh, 21 years ago. When I'm in the States, I said we would have found it in a garage, but we can't afford garages in central London, so it was definitely in the kitchen, as some of you will be only too familiar with that startup story. Uh, and what we are is we're a behavioral science business. I might just cue the, the slides just to give you a little bit of background. Uh, and so we, we started out um, walking the streets, trying to convince people that they should use psychology to improve the performance of their companies and the lives of the people who work in them. Uh, and I remember one of the first meetings saying to someone that psychology will really transform your business. We know all about it. And he said, I'm a Sagittarius. What does that tell you? And to which the, the obvious answer is, you don't know psychology from astrology, but I was just about calm enough not to say that. Um, but over the last 21 years, we've been working with most of the FTSE 100, most of the S&P 100, uh, and a range of other companies of digital sizes, of startups, grow-ups, all different stages, in order to help use behavioral science to transform behavior. Uh, and this has been incredibly exciting because the traditional world of, of human capital has looked at it through a lens of what we think should work, with the behavioral scientists look at the data of what actually does work. And the theme I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning that Charlie's asked me to introduce is a, a new research paper we're just about launching today on leadership, why leaders are in a funk and how to get them out of it. And we know how important leadership is because the data is really compelling. There's a study coming out of Wharton which looked at the electronic games industry and measured the impact of the creative person called the director on revenue and the, uh, the producer, in effect, the, the product manager on revenue. And the, the creative, you think, the person who decides what happens to the spears on level three or how fast the car goes and what happens to the exhaust. And all the you think that might be the big thing that changes it. But actually, it's the leader, it's the product manager who makes the big difference. They make more than three times the impact on revenue. So swapping a good product manager has more than three times the effect of swapping out a poor creative for a good creative. With apologies to those creatives in the room, you're still terribly important, just not quite as influential as it seems the product managers are. Loads more research shows that leadership is the single factor why people stay, why they grow, why organizations prosper. And yet, despite spending more and more on leadership, we seem to get results that are getting worse and worse. So here is the chart which shows the increase in spending year on year on leadership development. So everyone's recognized this is important. We want to develop our leaders. They're very hard always to recruit from outside. So often we have to grow them from within. But the consequence of this, you think, well, I'm spending more, I'm getting better leaders. But then we looked at the confidence in senior leaders. And over the same period, that goes down and down and down. So that's not a great place to, to, to think, look at a return on investment. But then what we looked at is what are the leaders themselves feeling? And amazingly enough, two-thirds of people who manage other people wish they didn't. It's just like the worst job in the world. You know, they're feeling overwhelmed. They're feeling that a lot of their work is completely pointless. And if you imagine what it's like as a, as, as a manager or a leader of people in an organization, you've got the people on the top claiming you're the permafrost, which is a pretty rude phrase. And if only you get out of the way, their brilliant vision would be realized. And you've got the people at the front line going, you'll never guess what my boss did today, which very rarely ends with anything positive. You look at the whole of society, basically, if you think of any film or TV show about managers or leaders in business, they're pretty unflattering. You know, Devil Wears Prada, horrible bosses, so good they made it twice, The Office. You know, basically, the boss is either an, a, a beast or a buffoon. So we've set leaders up to fail, and the way we've gone about developing them clearly isn't working. So as a team of psychologists, we would put, put our minds to work and studied over 200 peer-reviewed uh, reports from psychological journals to understand what's really going on and how we can shape things differently. And I think the first thing that we noticed was that the life of the leader is all about tensions. And most leadership development tries to encourage people to solve tensions, to fix things. But these things are unfixable. Actually, the tensions is the nature of business. In the same way that a bicycle without any tension is a lump of metal lying on the ground. It's completely useless. Well, organizational life is all about the tensions between looking after people, maybe, and getting short-term results, or even medium-term results, thinking innovatively, getting things to happen practically. Forever, at every stage, there are tensions that are going on. 
And so rather than tell people to fix those tensions, to solve the problem, actually it's to lean into them, to embrace them. That becomes the mindset that we need, the mental operating model that leaders need to have. And then, then we can start to make some, some significant shifts in how people choose to behave. So moving on from that, we looked at what happens at the different stages of leadership. What happens when you start at the beginning? Well, it's not the beginning when you start to learn anything new. Cooking, I'm just a terrible cook, and the beginnings of cooking is learning how to saute and to chop and to slice and dice and all sorts of things. And when it says in the, in, in the recipe book, cook until ready, that turns me into a head spin because I don't know what ready looks like. And I'm like, oh. So I kind of need quite a few rules to work out what to do. But as we become more expert at something, uh, be that tennis or cooking or uh, dancing or whatever else, then we start to rely less on the rules and the principles and much more on reading the situation on the context and knowing what to do as a result. And so what we need to do when we think about developing leaders is not rely just on doing the bit on the left, but also doing the section on the right. Now, on the left, there are some core skills that are really helpful to get right. And most of those, most organizations, have listed down somewhere in some form of grouping one way or another. Our form of grouping is to call them the first five letters of the alphabet, because that makes it really nice and easy to remember. But other organizations may have their own formula, uh, and that may work just as well or better for them. But what we find in each of these is the psychology tells us a lot about how to do it well. If I give you an example, feedback. Feedback is a theme that everyone thinks is very important. We must have a feedback culture. I remember going to see Sears, the American retailer, uh, and they just won an award for the most amount of feedback ever given and received in an organization. And I was like, are you sure that's a good thing? And they're like, we won the award, what do you reckon? Uh, anyway, <laughs> if you look at the performance of Sears thereafter, you could probably draw your own conclusions. It certainly went into a, a bit of a tailspin. Um, because feedback isn't necessarily a panacea. It isn't always a, a good thing to do. Uh, and actually, if you say to someone, can I give you some feedback? If someone says to you, can I give you some feedback? What's your reaction? Do you have to? What have I done wrong? Oh, I don't know. I'm supposed to think it's a gift, but I'm rather, can we do something else? Uh, and what we've found is that 33% um, of feedback actually leads to worse performance. 12% uh, leads to about the same, I'm uh, sorry, 15% leads to about the same, and 52% actually improves it. So what we then do is we analyze what is the nature of the feedback that makes a difference. And I guess give you a, a brief example from uh, kids. They've got two groups of kids, and they ask them to draw something imaginary with their hands. But they say, look, draw a tractor in a field or whatever. And with one group of kids, they say, my gosh, you're doing brilliantly. You're really artistic. Oh, that's fantastic. And in another group, they describe what they thought was going on. Oh, is that the wheel of the tractor? That looks like a fence that you're drawing there. Is that the sun that's shining that you're drawing? So they describe what they thought was going on. But as it was an invisible drawing in the sky, you couldn't actually judge whether it was good or bad. It was simply the view of the, of the, 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 the adjudicator. Then they tried another experiment with the same group of people. But this time, the adjudicator said, oh my gosh, you're really messing up. That's terrible. What are you doing there? You're making a mess of this. This is shocking. And the first group stopped almost immediately. They gave up. But the second group persisted far longer and kept trying and reinventing. And what that illustrates is the power of descriptive praise or descriptive feedback. So I say, I noticed you had a source in all your charts. I noticed you arrived punctually for this meeting. I noticed that when the CEO asked you a question, you asked a question back. And then you own the interpretation. That tells me you're willing to speak truth to power. That tells me you uh, have a focus on rigor. That tells me whatever it tells me. And then I can own that interpretation. So that way of giving feedback becomes far more effective than the general, uh, you're brilliant or lazy or fantastic or, or should do better or innovative or whatever it happens to be. So there's lots about the basics in here that are really important to get right. And just saying them or thinking we should do them doesn't the right, getting it the right way. There's great research which we can happily share another time on coaching. Uh, most coaching has a, people think that coaching is really helpful. So the average person when they receive coaching thinks it's improved their performance by a whopping 76%. So we then thought, well, that's brilliant. Well, more of that, performance will be up in the sky. But then what we looked at was a, a longitudinal multivariate analysis, which looks at objective factors of what happens as a result of coaching. And the actual improvement was 3.6%. So you start to see the self-delusion that we have sometimes have of what we think works versus what actually works. And more of that another time, I'm going to move on specifically to talk about leadership, which is the theme for this morning. And for this, I'm going to take you back to 1950 and the Monaco Grand Prix. And I'm going to tell you about the leader of, the, of Formula One back in then, was a guy called Fangio. 
He was the kind of the Lewis Hamilton or the Ayrton Senna of his day. Uh, and this is a story. He's, he's in the Monaco Grand Prix, and he's going up to a double hairpin bend. And he's leading the pack, and he's motoring away, and then he slows down at the first hairpin. And then he carries on round, and he slows down again at the second hairpin. And as he comes around the second hairpin bend, there's a massive pileup of cars. And had he gone on at the same speed as he was doing before, he would have crashed into those cars, might well have not survived, certainly wouldn't have gone on to win the race. But because he slowed down, he did navigate around the cars, and he went on to win the Monaco Grand Prix of 1950. So from a psychologist, psychologist's perspective, the interesting question is why? Why did he slow down? Uh, and of course we asked him, or the psychologist at the time asked him, why did you slow down? And frankly, he had no idea at all. Lucky socks, I'm a brilliant uh, racing car driver, that's part of being a genius. You know, Aquarius was in the moon, and blah, 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 endless nonsense, but it was all completely uh, rubbish. So then what they did was they got him to go back and, and, and relive the experience of driving up that first route. And as you can imagine, if you're the top racing car driver, the top of any sport, you're constantly noticing and aware and in the moment picking up signals of what's going on. And as he was looking straight ahead in the stands, a bit like this, there were a whole lot of, of, of spectators who would normally be looking at him. But they were all looking to one side because they could see the crash because they were up in the stands. And just at that moment, he noticed almost unconsciously that this was what was going on. He made sense, something's not right. Therefore, he chose to act differently, and then indeed he slowed down and navigated the cars. Now, I share this story because this is the mental mindset, even though most leaders don't realize it, that they are using the whole time. The greatest leaders are constantly noticing this, and it's a process called attunement. And we've broken it down into uh, four areas of what we do, and we do this kind of all the time when we're, we're good at leading. And the first thing is noticing. And quite often, we're so often in our own head that we don't notice what's going on. We don't see who is doing what, who has said what, what's not been said, what's been missed out, what are the signals that we need to pick up. Uh, and therefore, the noticing without judging becomes really important. And again, when we're in a rush, we often forget to do it. So we're kind of so busy getting on with it that we don't actually pick up the information. Then the next stage is to try and make sense of it. You know, I've had three people use the same word from different conversations, so either they're all talking to each other, all this is coming from an external source, and I need to piece these bits together. Then we have the choice about what we do. We maybe do nothing, just simple information, quite useful to have, I'll store it for now. Or we may choose to, to, to act in a certain way, and then we go on and do it. And obviously doing it well becomes really important. You might know all the steps in the, a gay Gordon Scottish reel, but if you can't get your two left feet, it doesn't much matter. So you've got to kind of act on it as well. So therefore, the, the theme we wanted to share, we've we launched a, a new research paper today, Leadership Regain, Why Leaders Are in a Funk and How to Get Them Out of It. There are copies at the back of the room, so please help yourself and available online. At the core of this is how do we set leaders up to master attunement? Because all the skills and training programs we provide won't have much impact unless we enable them to do this. And I'll just give you one final example from a, a client we're working with at the moment. And this is someone, you'll, many of you will have been to airports recently and had the pain of uh, sometimes trying to get through the first stages, let alone the later stages of check-in and so forth. Anyway, this lady was director in charge of the front house uh, of one of our leading airports. Uh, and she um, noticed after the first few months in her role that when she walked through the front of the, the airport at the beginning, either the check people at the check-in, the check-in staff, would either look her in the eye or they wouldn't. And she noticed this was a pattern that went on. And what she also noticed was when they did look her in the eye, the day would go relatively smoothly. But when they didn't look her in the eye, it was a lead indicator of there was going to be trouble ahead. And therefore, what she chose to do was when she got the eye contact, she would uh, carry on with the big transformation program she was leading, and she'd work on that. And when she didn't get the eye contact, she'd part the whole of her agenda for the day, roll her sleeves up, and get involved and help solve things. So there are very practical ways in which scan and attunement can help leaders be far more effective. And our opportunity is to make, that, make leadership learnable by teaching people how to, how to scan. So that's my thoughts for the day. I, hopefully that's been a, a useful introduction. If it is, please share with all your friends. If it isn't, we'll keep it as our little secret. Um, but in the meantime, Charlie, welcome. So what a brilliant start to the morning, and we're going to welcome uh, a third guest, um, Janet Sutcher. Janet Sutcher is the Chief People Officer, come on up, uh, of Cambridge University Press and Assessment. Uh, and if you'd like to sit in the middle seat there, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have a, a little conversation um, now.
about leadership. Thank you for uh, sharing this incredible research you've done. Um, when you talk about lost leaders, I think about myself. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think the reality is, um, you know, lockdown, you know, caused lots and lots of changes. But even a small team like ours, building software and hosting this event, you know, it's, you know there was that kind of to do it in year one. In year two, you know, there's been some people we've hired and have never been to our office and so on. And, in, you know, side, you know, what do we do next? We've actually done a big swing to getting back into the office. Um, but it's been, it's been absolutely fascinating. And I actually blame my own style for needing to have people in the room because it's the way I know how to manage and, and you know, drive the team. But um, Janet, we'd love to hear about you. Do you want to just share a little bit about what you've been doing and how you think about this new world that we're in? Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges we've had is uh, amalgamating two organisations um, in through this process. So last year, in August, we had to bring together Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment, which is approximately 7,000 people, much of which we had to do um, the preparation for virtually. So that was a huge challenge. And I think working at that sort of scale um, really does make it much more difficult. And, you know, the, the description of how you scan, how do you scan when you're doing Teams Live, how do you scan when you have uh, got people scattered in lots of different locations and groups of people in different stages of lockdown. So we really had to try and develop different techniques to actively listen to our people. Uh, and that was not just working through that traditional hierarchy. It was thinking about where are the touch points, where are the, the networks we can tap into, where are the conversations we can have, how can we create these virtual water cooler moments and understand the data points and what it was telling us because we could, we could merge by doing the usual kind of here's the organogram, we're going to create these leaders, we're going to give them a, a handbook for the new organisation and that's going to be easy but it was actually about the fact this is going to be quite difficult, it's going to take us time and we're going to have to coach and support people to work with that sense of uncertainty. Um, so yeah. And, and how has that changed now things have settled a little bit? <laughs> a bit, yeah. A bit. <laughs> I mean, is, is, is it, it could, could, and it, I mean, I personally, I'd love to understand really what worked best for mm. creating those mm. moments. Mm. Um, and yeah, and, and how you see it, I guess, evolving. Mm. I think from a personal point of view, one of the things I really resonated with was the description that, uh, you know, in the paper about people immediately wanting to fix things. And that's certainly my preferred style, you know, mm. Uh, you know, description of the lady in the airport that I absolutely recognize that right roll your sleeves up get in there and when you realize you can't do that um, So we we really did spend a lot of time listening and that for me was the biggest change It was how do I listen? So how do I get engaged and now we've got a lot more momentum around it And I'd say we still have lots of people working hybrid. We're like everybody else struggling in that transition mm -hmm. But what we're finding is people who previously didn't speak, didn't give us information, didn't give us the data we needed are actually much more willing and, and more comfortable to do that. So that's made a big difference and really helped us with, with that integration. And for me, it is about that behavior of those leaders as we move forward and how do we really support them to be comfortable with the fact we've still got customers, we've still got a job to do, and it's going to feel difficult uh, with integration and coming out of COVID for, for quite some time. And so the way we provide them with that support feels really important. Absolutely. Um, it, you, you mentioned 7,000. Mm. So uh, how many of those people are still working at home versus how many people have come back to the office roughly? It if you can share that. Yeah, it varies from location to location. So in Cambridge, we've got about 2,500 people. I would say we're probably seeing, uh, we're doing the same thing lots of people are doing, seeing kind of hump in the middle of the day, at uh, the middle of the week rather. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, at its peak, maybe we've got sort of 50% of people coming into the workplace. Uh, there are still people who've not been in at all. Um, the description of people who've started and then never actually been physically connected. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing what everyone else is doing, putting on lots of events and things to create those touch points. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that scanning that's talked about is, is so much more challenging when you've got that, that hybrid environment. And in some ways it's worse, it's more difficult. When you've got everybody on screen, you can create a virtual space yes. in which you can have those conversations, pick up those signals. Um, when you've got hybrid, it's quite easy to then not pick up on the signals from the people who are virtual, who are virtual and yeah. to just overhear the people who are in the room. And from a sort of EDIB perspective, I think that can be a problem as well. Is that something you're, you've been seeing well, as well? We're, we're certainly noticing that there's yeah. a, a depletion in social capital, the sense yeah. which people feel yeah. a sense mm -hmm. of belonging or wanting to be somewhere at work. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And from in, in society, if you think over the, the centuries, we've had different forms of community. It might be our local church or it might be our uh, village or something like mm. that. And increasingly, in recent times, it's been our place of work that we felt the biggest connection with. Mm. And that has been really reduced off the back of uh, remote working. And therefore, people no longer have the, 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 the credits in the emotional bank account to do mm. someone a favor or to mm. help out or to forgive. Right. Mm. And therefore, people are increasingly frustrated with work, therefore the great resignation. But actually, yeah. the way to solve that is to rebuild relationships. And that requires some inhuman person-to-person -person time. Oh, it absolutely does. And, and new techniques and tools that hopefully mm. people can learn. Yes. Yeah. But so what, if somebody, I mean, if a leader doesn't want to go down that route, you've seen some people just saying, look, I mean, I'm going to do an Elon Musk and it's, you know, in the <laughs> office or I'll assume you've resigned. We've seen a few of those, and that often leads to some resignations. So <laughs> that's a, I think that's a what his high risk. Was. I think exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you want to deplete your workforce, that's a good way of going about it. Yeah. And there's some banks and consultancies that have taken the same approach. Mm. Uh, and there are others that have said, you know, um, Twitter pre Elon Musk, because they kind of work from home as long as you like. Yeah. And I think the, the psychology and the science really strongly advocates a hybrid model, yeah. where you're spending some time together, right? And you're finding reasons to spend time together, but you're also using that as informal time as well. So it's not overly structural, mm -hmm. just about collaboration. But you come in, so you might have a team day once a week, and then another day you come in and meet people and catch up and so forth. And there are organizations that don't have any uh, human contact. There's a great study looking at uh, full-stack engineers mm -hmm. who, by and large, I'm going to paraphrase, but tend to work from home with their headphones mm -hmm. on kind of when they want. Uh, and the study looked at what was the single factor that most accelerated speed to value of full-stack engineers when they joined a new organization. And the single factor that made significantly more impact than anything else was in-person of two, week onboard, two weeks of in-person onboarding. Mm. Mm. So even for a role yeah. that's fully remote, actually making that connection at the beginning really helped them accelerate. And, and then having a certain frequency of in-person afterwards, or they can then just stay fully remote? This study didn't particularly follow that. But okay. the, the, again, the research, the psychology would show bring people back every once in a while is it's a healthy It's a big thing. discussion, I mean, in the, in the tech industry especially, and, and um, you know, when you think startups which are innovating and they're iterating very quickly and then going to see the customer and they go, that's good, but that, that, they're like this thing over here and you need to do those tight cycles. Just, you know, you, you mentioned scanning. Just mm. how, how do you get a feel and keep that team mm. in sync when things are changing so quickly, I think is one of the challenges. And of course, your point about engineers, I think is, is spot on. I mean, you know, I can certainly speak for our experience directly. Um, most of them have to suffer having headphones on in the office yeah. so that they can get their work done. Mm. And they've been at home without the headphones on in their you know, home office or in their living room or wherever they are, very happily being productive. Yes. And you, you can, it's very clear why that could be a challenging thing. I mean, I asked some of our engineers, you know, is there one thing that you really get from being in the office? And they said, well, I guess we used to go to lunch together and talk about whatever, not work, um, and that social connection piece. Mm. I liked your idea, that, you know, the bank and, you know, yes. the favors piece. I think, I think that is a thing. Well, every time someone says it's really hard to get stuff done around here or so-and-so function is not helping, yeah. my response is, well, ha have you spent time with them? Mm. Have you got to know them? Yeah. Yeah. Because in the end, we all connect with people and we go, oh, mm. you know, I like Janet, she may have done something that annoyed me, but I know she meant well, or she's done something brilliant, <laughs> how can I help her? But if I haven't met her, I'm like, who is Janet? What's she doing? Why has that happened? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. she's like, why can't Octavius help me out? I just asked a simple question. He doesn't seem to have responded. Yeah, the, the chance of cognitive dissonance in that environment is, is quite great, well, isn't it? And, and you know, we've had people who've um, had never experienced our organization except on a screen. And one of my team said that to me the other day, and I thought, God, that's true, because we've had all these people who've joined, yeah. uh, it, you know, and we've integrated, and they've not, you know, they've not experienced the new organization apart from something on Teams. So you know, making the, uh, the workplace a destination of choice and building that sense of community, which is where we're using networks, you know, staff networks and communities of practice as a way of mm -hmm. doing that and sharing and problem solving and kind of democratizing yes. some of that connection as well. So I've got a question for both of you, which is if you have um, a team and maybe... There's a, there's a policy overall. You know, to what degree can you have policies per department and then make exceptions if somebody says, I want to work for you, but I'm just never coming in? Maybe all once a quarter. And, and, and you have another department where you want them in three days a week, let's say. I mean, without it feeling like discrimination of some form, <laughs> you know, you know how, how do you get that balance right? I mean, it's complicated, right? 
It is, and I think it's, it is a bit of a leadership journey for all of us, and I think it's also just about being authentic and saying we haven't got all the answers. So we started, like everybody else, saying oh, we'll give a bit of guidance, we'll have a policy, and we ended up saying we just can't have a policy. We'll have some principles, we'll, we'll push this, we'll lead by example, mm -hmm. but actually you know, what works for one team or even for someone with a particular set of skills, if you've got someone who's really difficult to attract, then you and they say to you, look, we'll come and work for you, and we'll actually, you know, particularly for us, trying to really attract digital talent in Cambridge. People think, oh, Cambridge University, a bit dusty, you know, and um, and so we think, you know, no, no, actually, we are, you know, really a, a destination of choice. But we mm. can, if we can give people that flex. I come back to the issue of tensions. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. actually, all of these are tensions. Absolutely. There are no final yeah. answers. There's no perfect solution. Mm. There's no. People say leadership is a bit like whack-a-mole. You, you've dealt with something, you're dreaming with something else. But actually, that's just the wrong framing of looking at it. Right. Mm. Leadership mm. is all about embracing tensions, recognizing where they are, and how, what levers to pull to manage the tensions in a slightly better way. Mm. And once you recognize that, well, of course, you're going to have some teams that want something different from other teams mm. that don't. But and the idea of there's a single rule that applies to everybody is... is, is that's, I think, a very helpful point to understand. Is yeah. that you, I mean... You said it. You, you can't have a single policy that you put across no. the principles. Yeah. No. Well, one of the phrases I heard recently, which I quite like, was, you know, one size fits nobody, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is uh, yeah. true. Very, very much so. <laughs> That's great. And, and when you come back to scanning again, what, I mean, I'd love to know from both of you, what is seen as now best practice for making sure you get that connection across everybody as a leader? Mm. Because it's, obviously, it's, you know, we can do that with everybody in the room here right now. Mm. It's so hard over teams, and it's not, it's, mm. it's not a deficiency of their technology. Those technologies have come on leaps and bounds. But what, you, what have you found that does well, work in the practice? The single thing that most matters most is, is noticing, yeah. Yeah. listening and noticing. Janet's talking about listening and really hear what people are saying mm. and what they're not saying. And by and large, people tell you everything you need to know, often in the first meeting, but if you're not, it only works if you're paying attention. Mm. If your whole head is like, what am I supposed to say, or how am I going to do this, or how am I coming across, then you're not picking up any of that information. So noticing is the most important thing. And then just deferring judgment, not mm. rushing to a view whether they're lazy or brilliant or mm. uh, engaged or disengaged, but actually just mm. constantly course correcting. There's a great study kind of Philip Tetlock, you may have read Super yes, Forecasting. Yeah, amazing guy, yeah. Amazing guy, who, who identified the characteristics of the people who are best able to predict the future, which is kind of a useful <laughs> skill to have for accurately predicting the future. It is an amazing book, actually. It's amazing book. It? Yeah. Uh, it's a longitudinal study over eight years, and it's, it's a great body of work. Uh, and the key thing, one of the key things, is to continue to gather new information and continue to alter your forecast as you're gathering that new information. Right. So if a leader's that suggest one thing to do, it's a two thing, but they go together, it's the noticing and gathering information yeah. and being curious, and it's the constantly altering your sense-making in light of what you've gathered. Really interesting, because uh, I think some of us are definitely inclined occasionally to jump to a conclusion <laughs> quite quickly. <laughs> it, it can right? happen. It can happen, right? So, so that's, that's, that's really good advice. Um, and, and so we were talking about kind of the current state and then going forward. Mm. How, how does... Um, how does one really plan for this, this next stage? Do we, we assume it's just it's going to be hybrid for, you know, for good now? We, is that what you're expecting? I, I think that's what I'm expecting. Yeah. I think most people are expecting that. I think there have been huge benefits. And mm -hmm. you know, for us, we've got people in lots of different countries. It's meant people have connected, been able to work on projects together. So keeping hold of that sense of belonging is really important. Um, but I think the point about listening is so important as well. You know, mm. if you're, the thing about, I found about being in the virtual environment, being on Teams, you immediately think, gosh, I'm on a screen, right, I've got to broadcast. Mm -hmm. So you've really got to very consciously think, you know, how do I listen? How do I keep listening? Mm -hmm. How do I? Those people are putting their Zoom face on. Yes, so that's you, right, absolutely. You know, we all know how to show up on a virtual thing, and there's a half-hour meeting, and there's usually a lot of people, and you only have to say so much, and a couple mm. of comments in chat, and you're covered. Mm. And therefore, it's finding ways as a leader to know how someone's faring yeah, mm. beyond absolutely. just watching how they show up on Zoom. Which is where that, that sort of taking the time to listen to what people are saying. And also, I think we were chatting before, weren't we, about the hierarchy and how you end up in a position where you sort of request a meeting. So you have to formally request a meeting to have a conversation with someone on Teams, perhaps, where before you might have said, seen them in the lunch queue or you might see them in a different mm. setting and be able to say, oh, you know, I was just thinking about this. What do you think? Mm. Um, so kind of retaining that sense of being kind of human and approachable so that you can have those conversations um, becomes... And a, how do you do that remotely? I think sometimes you just have to have fun online and give people space and not feel you've got to come on and make this grand announcement or make, you know, 
come up with loads of solutions. You've got to give space and maybe have open conversation. And I've had to learn what you were saying about feedback. It's quite interesting. Everybody sort of goes, ooh, when people say feedback. But I, you know, actively seeking that feedback online, you have to be very conscious of doing that and saying, you know, tell me what you think. And actually, you know, embrace the tumbleweed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. when, <laughs> when people are not saying anything, just wait. Mm -hmm. But it's always that thing of, oh, just fill the space. Right, you know? right, got it. And, so, and, the, and the tool, when you, when you think of that, online check-in is Slack or Teams, it's, it's messaging? Or is it, you know, just calling somebody, like, without a planned meeting? Because mm. you can get into this kind of structured meeting. I mean, you know, I'm sure all of our diaries mm. can be back-to-back -back through the whole day, and where's mm. the time for that, that moment that you would have walked down a corridor and just said, I hate somebody for 10 mm. seconds? I think it's creating virtual space for people to drop into if they want okay. to. I think it's, you know, you know, I'm not very good at this, but I'm, I have people in my team who are really good at using Miro. You know, okay. just creating different opportunities for people to have conversation, um, you know, having a, a session that people can come to if they choose to, um, not making a sort of formal agenda. Mm -hmm. Teams, you know, Teams is quite good in terms of, um, you know, the chat and things. Teams mm -hmm. Live is less accessible. That's more difficult because okay. you really are just in broadcast then. And then when you're having those mm. conversations, often have them without an agenda. Yeah. You have yeah. one-to-ones with their manager and yeah. direct report. Yeah. It's all about tasks and activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and actually, just how just are you? Yeah. What, what, yeah. Yeah. Both of you have touched on the great resignation, and, and I'd love to understand from each of you what you think is kind of at the heart of that. And, and, and you know, if, if you're going to be a leader that is going to attract employees and, and you know, be mm -hmm. a, 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 you know, the, the preferred place to take that next opportunity, yeah. you know, what do we have to get right? Well, really, a, a large part of it is about belonging and yes, feeling that connection. Definitely. And if you can find ways to bring people physically together, we just brought the whole of our, our mind gym company together in Edinburgh, uh, the UK company, Mir company, and then we're doing the same in Nashville next week for the US company. And that physical sense of spending two or three days together, getting to know each other, suddenly reminds you why you're here and what you're part mm -hmm. of, and you're part of something bigger. So we really advocate finding ways to bring people physically together, mm -hmm. and that will remind people why they are working where mm -hmm. they're working, mm -hmm. uh, and what it is they like about that tribe, or indeed don't, but at least it's a distinctive tribe, whereas at the moment it's just dissipated. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, until we start bringing people back, I think we're going to keep see people keeping moving on mm. and then feeling slightly frustrated because the next place isn't quite as good as it looked at on the job spec and wasn't quite <laughs> what it was set up to be and it ends up being not that different from the place that you just left but it's then and what we may then see the companies that are clever about this will see a lot of boomerang employees mm. so we're seeing for example a number of boomerang uh, full stack engineers coming back to us who mm. kind of went try somewhere else thought so and then they returned right. to mine and so, so when you get a resignation notice fight it or Embrace it. Embrace it. Yeah. First thing is to understand why someone's leaving. Mm. Mm. And if they're leaving for a good reason, then encourage them. It's a fantastic thing. If someone's come to your business and as a result of what they've done is able to do something they couldn't have done before, that's something to celebrate. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and, and cherish it. And then they may come back. And, mm. and that may be great as well. Brilliant. And we always talk about moving the conversation forward with concrete actions here. So we want to pick two concrete actions. Are there any things that you've both observed that are just absolute no-nos and... You know, if you thought this was a good idea, just don't do it. You mentioned that stat on feedback earlier, which is, you know, for any <laughs> managers, like, you know, am I going to make things worse? Um, but, uh, you know, what, what have you seen that people should just stay away and well clear of? Um, I think people should stay away clear of what often what we think, the assumptions are what we think works. Okay. Because there's so much, I mean, coaching is a great example. Mm. You know, coaching, a lot of coaching is done based on likability. Mm. Another thing I'd be really wary of is 360 feedback. Mm. You know, again, the research shows really compellingly out of the US, high street, uh, uh, students in university colleges rate their professors. You can also measure their grades. The ones with the most popular professors have the worst grades. So be really wary of relying on mm. just taking at face value 360 feedback. That's another thing I'd avoid. Janet? Yeah, well, apart from I'd agree with everything Octavia said, <laughs> I would also say, you know, just don't overmanage. Um, you know, yes, the management skills are really important, but I think really encouraging and supporting people to live with that ambiguity and be comfortable with it, you know, not wait for the kind of everything to settle because it just isn't ever going to settle. So how do we live with that mm. and really um, get people comfortable, get le our leaders comfortable in that space? Brilliant. And on the on the positive side, what's the one thing you would say, and we, we're going to throw the questions to the audience, is like, this is just a no-brainer today, when you go back to your organization or tomorrow, whenever it is. Well, I'm going to say notice. Notice what's going notice. on yeah. and defer yeah. judgment about... Whether it's in person or online, just 
just notice just, what's just, going on. Yeah. There was a, years ago, we did some work with a, a big telco that you'll know, and, and they wanted a leadership development program. And the big issue that came up in the training needs analysis was I never have time to think. Yeah. So we said, brilliant. We, well, everyone said this, never have time to think. So we had a, a lunch on the first day, and we, we had the iPhones and, and Samsung Galaxy Spa, where you handed in your mobile device, and we looked after it because you were very busy. And then you walked in for lunch, and we said, we're now going to have a silent lunch. And it was the nearest thing to a corporate revolution. Everyone went ballistic. How dare you waste my time in this way? Until we pointed out, you see, you never have time to think. We're now giving you time to think. Maybe the problem is you don't know how to think once you've got the time. And they went, oh, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Janet, anything you'd like to add to that? I don't think I could add to that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, do we have the microphones? There we go. Um, Mr. Greenberg. There's a mic coming to you, if you just wait one second. Thank you, Charlie. Lovely to see you. And you too. Um, Octavius, outstanding presentation. I'm sure you could talk at this at length. Um, I'd like to ask all of you a question around what is generally referred to as social and emotional learning, what is referred to previously as soft skills, and how or why what you're doing and the research you've gleaned is not taught in schools today and helping young people prepare themselves for the workforce. Do you have a view on that, please? Um, m m it's, it's the meta skill that we're all going to need to flourish. Uh, I think increasingly it is coming into some school agendas, mm -hmm. but still at a very early stage. And that the sooner we can build up those social skills, the better. I think there's also a, a, a real consequence. We talked about the workplace consequence of COVID. But actually, the, the effect on children has been enormous. Yeah. And a lot of that social forming that would have taken place in the last two years just didn't take place. And therefore, it's, there's an extra need to help kids advance in how they build relationships, recalibrate relationships. The, the most important thing, and we run a, a, a free parenting classes across the UK. I've done for 10 years. Because the research shows the single factor that most determines uh, uh, life outcomes beyond where you're born is the quality of the parenting. Uh, and so we run, we run free, not, uh, someone says it's not for profit, I said no, it's for loss. We simply run them in, 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 in challenging parts of the country. Uh, and a key part of this is helping parents with the social skills and then building up that capability in their children. We just wait for the microphone here, sorry. If I can suggest to you from my experience, I used to work for a little company called Apple, and the engagement <laughs> we built at Apple was by engaging teachers in the staff room. And you have two impacts there. One is you impact with leadership going up, yeah. and secondly, you impact with students at the bottom end. Yes. And I'm encouraging you, and I will reach out to you after this and see if I can get some of your time and some of your bandwidth to support in that campaign. I look forward to talking. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, do we have another question? There's one at the left over here. Over here. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, my question is... Who's your question for? Well, I mean, whoever wants to take it. But okay. uh, in, well, in face of the environment crisis, I guess leaders are now, there's a tension around doing the right thing, but also the profits. So I guess we have leaders who need to be brave enough to challenge, take risks, uh, and also manage, and there's performance versus building well-being. So how... What, how can we create uh, and enforce the, the right qualities well, in future leaders and current leaders? Just curious about your, your thoughts around this. Janet, would you like to take that? I'll try. <laughs> oh, you're... Um, I think it, you know, the environment is a, is a leadership challenge for all of us at the moment, and I think in doing the right thing, clearly you know, there's a lot of conversation about greenwashing, etc. You know, how do we genuinely you know, do the right thing and make the right decisions. And I think some of that is about being authentic. I think if, you know, you know, we talk about skills and some people I think are better at the sort of soft skills that we were just discussing, but it's about that authenticity and honesty and actually supporting people to do that and creating an environment where there can be trust. And I think that's, that's for me, is one of the most important things in developing any team and developing any leaders. And that means we, we encourage our people to, to call, call us out if there are things that we're not doing as we should. And, that goes for kind of all aspects of leadership going forward. And I think I heard something about the tension between performance and well-being. Did I hear that yeah, in the question? Yeah. I think we're, we're very excited to preview. We're going to publish a report on well-being in the autumn where we've looked at what really makes a difference mm. 
And what's very interesting is most of the initiatives, um, we were with a, a, a meditation app company that you'll have heard of in San Francisco the other day, and said, you know, we, we love what you do, but frankly, I'm not sure how much it's really improving the well-being of the employees who, who use it. And they went, I think you're probably right. And a lot of these things, whether it's fresh fruit or massages or whatever, aren't really solving the problem because there's a massive self-selection bias. So basically the people who choose these things, the ones who would use them in any case, and the ones who are working more than 50 hours a week and incredibly stressed, aren't, haven't got time. You tell them to go to a yoga class. They're like, ah, oh, the last thing is a yoga class. You don't realize. And therefore what we've identified is what does make a difference. Things, for example, like certainty make an enormous impact on well-being. Yeah. Certainty. Certainty is a yeah. significant. And, and having some degree of control over what you're doing yes. in your workload. And that comes back to being not afraid to call things out and, mm. and knowing that you're not going to be seen as, well, if you're not working 50 hours a week like the rest of us, then you're just... You know, not a good employee. <laughs> We're going to fit one more question in, so if anybody has one, um, be ready in a second. That word certainty, that's a really interesting statement. Can we just unpack that just a little bit and its relationship to well-being? Yes. Um, the, the single, one of the, there are five factors that greatly affect your well-being, all of which you can, which you can most affect in the world of work. And obviously, other stuff like sleep and diet, which is slightly separate. Um, and one of them is certainty. And the, f so the more I get surprises, I turn up and the mood my boss is in will determine the day, but I have no idea what mood they'll be in. Mm -hmm. mm. Or I think I'm working on something and suddenly the whole project's up in the air mm. and it's all being changed. And I don't know. All of that uh, is, is very um, unhelpful for our, creates ill being in effect. Um, and therefore, the more we can say, concede changes in advance, guide people to where things are going, the more we can show the single factor that most determines the success of a partner of a professional services firm is not cognitive ability or hours worked, it's emotional self-regulation, being able to hold steady in situations. So does that give you a bit more on certain? Brilliant, thank you. The last question. There's a lady here at the front on the left. I'm oh, you've got watch, the mic. <laughs> oh, there's a lady at the back. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation, a really great discussion. And, you know, obviously tone from the top in the way that you describe um, um, setting how, how we get back people into work and being productive and all this is, is, is essential. But most people are actually managed in teams. So I wondered if you had some observations on how you actually then actually filter that down to the people in middle management who don't get to go to things like this and hear all of these fantastic discussions and, um, and how they, because they've, they've got very strong muscle memory in terms of their default setting and managing in, um, in phys physically present con um, constructs. So their, their kind of skills in terms of the noticing and listening are much less well developed, I would say. Mm. I can um, yeah. have a go at that one if you like. Uh, I think it's, it's always the eternal challenge, isn't it? If you just work through the hierarchy, you're not going to make the difference that you would like. And we, we've done that, certainly at Cambridge University Press, an assessment by using networks, using communities of practice, actually give, bringing those managers together, having conversation, exposing them to some of these things. You know, we've developed things like change capability toolkits that we run, that we give to our managers and allow them to use. Because I think even if you can't have certainty, if you can have some degree of control and you can be comfortable in that environment and be able to listen actively to what your people are telling you and to recognize that as being something that is part of your role, that it's not the traditional sort of managerial role as you, as you describe, and people feeling comfortable with that, because leading happens at all levels. It doesn't just happen at the top of an organization. That's absolutely right. And I wouldn't be forgiven by my esteemed colleagues here, Desi, Crystal, Cordelia, and Gracie. Wave your hands if you want to come and chat to them uh, later uh, without um, sharing what Mind Gym does, which is precisely focusing on management. We run bite-sized 90-minute workshops that are live, in person, or live virtual on all these topics. There are 100 topics from conflict handling to sort of for stress to um, motivate to, and so on and so forth. And what we found is doing little and often over time is how you build uh, any new habit, but in particular management capability. So you know, a big program with a, a company you'll know, a big tech company you'll know well, where people go to a one session a month over the course of a year, and we found that we measured pre and post the manager efficacy using three different kinds of measures. And not only was there a significant positive delta in those that had been to the distributed program, but actually those who hadn't, the standard was seen as going down because the overall level had increased. So really, it's a little and often keep learning, get access to the practical insights, the base in psychology, base in science, and then practice them and come back and review. Brilliant. Well, listen, we, we are out of time, unfortunately, for questions, but can I invite you both to take more questions afterwards outside? Fantastic. Great. So thank you, Octavius Black. Absolutely brilliant presentation. Great to have you here. Janet Scotch, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, uh, thank you for joining us for our opening session on the future of work and the employee experience. 
and uh, we'll be handing out some reports that you've brought with uh, us as well. So the, um, uh, <laughs> Rose wouldn't forgive me, and Dan, if I didn't tell you there's a copy of Leadership Regained ready for you at the table at the back there, if you would like to have a copy of this, which will give you all the insights. I saw a few of you taking glorious photographs of the slides. They're all in here with a much better rendition of what they mean than I managed a little earlier, but <laughs> thanks for your patience. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Octavius. Thank you, Janet. It's a, it's a brilliant session. Um, we're going to, rather than have a pause now, we're going to have a quick, we've slightly run over. Uh, we're just going to change the stage over and start straight away. We did have a brilliant moment backstage where we were missing a panelist and someone said, oh, they're in the audience, which is, oh, it's very relaxed. So they're going to be going backstage now. It's interesting that session in terms of the future of work for anyone that was here on the Monday. What we've essentially heard is practical tools for leaders and teams, which kind of goes with the Poppy Jamie session we had with Caroline Williams uh, on 